I'd like to welcome you to week four of our study on the doctrine of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, it's been a, a joy so far as we have looked um, in this great study. And so let me just uh, jump right into our lesson tonight. We have um, uh, looked at the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have stated that it is the first act of God toward man in the gospel. Now, there is the birth, there is the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the coming. The seven acts of God toward man that make up this uh, wonderful gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians tonight to get started, uh, chapter 6. Book of Ephesians, chapter number 6, and we'll get started uh, reading a few verses here, beginning in verse number 18. Number 18. Now Ephesians chapter 6 is an interesting chapter, and we know it to be the chapter uh, where uh, children are to obey their parents, and servants, uh, their masters, their uh, bosses, not with eye service, he says, uh, as men pleasers. We know this chapter to be the whole armor of God chapter, beginning in verse uh, number 10, all the way down through verse 18. And uh, so when we think about this, uh, we find uh, that uh, this chapter, chapter 6, the last chapter of the book of Ephesians, uh, uh, it's been preached many times. A lot of the verses have been uh, uh, preached and uh, expounded. But what we find is a lot of times uh, that uh, verse uh, number 19 and uh, verse uh, number 20 uh, is um, seemingly uh, overlooked. To get to verse 20, verse 19 is overlooked. But watch this. Now let's, let's read in verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. As for me, that the utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, verse number 19 to make known the mystery of the gospel. Now, what I want to deal with tonight uh, is uh, the life of Christ. We're talking about this gospel, this uh, doctrine of soteriology, the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the life of Christ. I want to remind you how important it is uh, that we understand how all of this goes together. Can I say to you that there are seven acts of God toward man? Right in the middle is the death, the death of the cross, Christ crucified. I always like to say that the death of the cross is the central, and it reaches back to the birth and the sinless life. It reaches forward to the ascension and the coming. But there we see the death of Christ right there in the center. But there would be no death had there not been a sinless life. There would be no sinless life had there not been a virgin birth. And so when we think about tonight, I want to talk about the earthly life of Christ and how that impacts the doctrine of soteriology. Now, when we come to uh, the earthly life of Christ, it first of all speaks to us of his message of his message. Isn't it amazing uh, that the four gospels give us the earthly ministry of Christ? And we need that, don't we? We need all four gospels. I say many times uh, people are still searching for some lost books of the Bible instead of uh, learning the ones that they found. And uh, we don't need any lost books, amen? We're not looking for any missing books. What we need is the gospel record um, which gives us the earthly life of Christ. How important. Now, when we started this study, we reminded you we're going to use scriptures and we're going to uh, teach things. Uh, you're not going to walk away from here and say, well, I never heard that. We have heard that and we need to keep hearing it. One of the things that we need more than anything is how that Jesus uh, 
lived uh, on this earth uh, uh, in a body and sinless. There was no sin in him. Boy, when we look at this, we notice his earthly message. And he came uh, uh, to uh, give us uh, uh, his message. Now, when we think about uh, the message of Christ, it is confound, uh, com combined uh, uh, in the, the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is very important that we understand this. You see, Matthew was written to a Jewish, uh, Jewish audience. Uh, Jesus is king. The book of Mark written to a Roman audience that Jesus is a servant. The book of Luke written to Theophilus. Jesus is the son of man, the humanity of Christ. Tales of Christ being a friend of sinners in the book of Luke. The prodigal, you remember him, the prodigal son. The prostitute that washed Jesus' feet with her hair. The ten lepers, how that Jesus was a friend of of sinners. And so the book of Luke written to Theophilus and then the book of John really to a general audience um, of the seven I am's of Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the son of God. Uh, the deity of Christ is seen in the book of John. And so we need it all. We need all of the four gospel records to give us the earthly life of Christ. The earthly life of Christ is so important uh, uh, in the gospel message. Now, this, this earthly life reveals his message. It was a historical message. Luke writing in chapter 1 and verse number 1, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of the things wherein thou hast been instructed. And we understand that the message of Christ uh, is a historical message uh, uh, wrapped up in these uh, Gospels uh, of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Uh, we find the earthly ministry of Christ uh, set in the four Gospels. We learn about uh, his life uh, uh, because of the writings of these four men. And so we find that, uh, that uh, many will say that these Gospels uh, contradict or, or they're so alike that there's no sense in having them all. Let me just remind you there are four and we need all four. And thank God uh, that we get the perspective and we get the understanding uh, of the life of Christ from these writings. Do not buy in to anyone ever discrediting uh, the four gospels uh, of uh, the New Testament. Uh, do not allow someone to get you to doubt whether or not these four gospels belong uh, in the word of God. It is from these Gospels that we learn what we know about Christ. Can I remind you uh, that uh, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke are often called the Synoptic Gospels because uh, they are some uh, similar stories and stories in common and share similar language. The Gospel of John is written in a different style and, and provides uh, uh, most unique uh, material and more uh, uh, information than the other three are, have given. And so when we think about the word gospel, we say a lot of times the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of John. Uh, what are we saying? Well, the, the word gospel comes from an old English word, God spell. It's the Greek word evangelion. And what it literally means is good tidings uh, are good news. And this word uh, is acquainted with both the oral and the written word. I mean, it was always uh, being proclaimed. Uh, it is the good news um, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we think about this, the four Gospels were written to give us four portraits uh, of uh, Jesus and his life upon this earth. Through the Gospels, uh, we uh, understand specific periods uh, and places, uh, people and purposes, uh, and how that all of that goes into the earthly ministry of uh, the Lord Jesus. And I want to emphasize tonight the importance again of his earthly sinless life. It speaks of uh, his message, the message about Jesus, the, the writings about our Lord. Here is what 
happened. Here is what was going on when the Lord uh, was upon this earth. It is a historical message. It uh, it uh, covers the, the, the time and it covers uh, the history of that. Please understand how important it is that we know that Jesus did come to this earth. He was born of a virgin and he did live um, uh, upon this earth. This is very important to the gospel message. It was a historical message. Some people say, well, I don't want to hear nothing about history, uh, about uh, uh, the past. I want to hear about the history of Jesus. Uh, all I want to hear is about Jesus. Well, you can't hear about Jesus without understanding the history. And thank God that the recording uh, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give us the historical message. Uh, it teaches us of what happened uh, when Jesus was upon this earth. It is a theological message. Not only is it a historical message, it is a theological message. John 20 and the last uh, few verses says, And many other things or many other signs uh, truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, uh, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life uh, through his name. Theology, the study of God. Christology, the study of Christ. We find uh, that Jesus Christ uh, is the Son of God and that believing in him we can have life uh, through his name. You see, when we read the four Gospels, we learn of the historical message of Christ, uh, but the theological message of Christ, uh, Jesus is the Son of God in the flesh. Now, we dealt with him being in the flesh. We dealt with him coming. Uh, we dealt with him uh, how that he came uh, as a virgin. Uh, and uh, we want to notice uh, that not only did he come, uh, uh, but he lived. And in living, uh, he fulfilled everything uh, that was to be fulfilled. Uh, and no sin was found in him. No guile was found in his mouth. Uh, and we want to emphasize that uh, by looking at how his earthly life reveals uh, his message. We, we know about the Lord Jesus because of this Bible. We learned about Christ because of this Bible. Do, do, we, do we understand that his earthly life speaks of his message? How did you learn uh, that God so loved the world? Well, you learned that in John. How did you learn that uh, the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost? You learned it in Luke. Uh, how did you learn uh, about the birth of Jesus being on this wise? You learned it in Luke. Uh, I mean, we could go around and talk about each gospel, but I remind you uh, that we must identify and understand where we get what we believe and we get the earthly life. It is compacted uh, and revealed in the Gospels. That's why they're important to study. That's why they're so important that we learn uh, of the life of Christ and we see exactly what was going on uh, in his earthly ministry. So his earthly life uh, reveals his message, who he was, uh, where he came from, what he did. All of that is so important. Preachers, preach the Gospels. Teach about uh, the earthly life of Christ. Boy, it's amazing what we see and how we can make so much application uh, uh, to what Jesus did in his earthly life, uh, to even our life today. It's amazing uh, uh, that we find uh, uh, the Jesus in the gospel so relevant uh, in our hearts and in our life. And so the earthly life of Christ reveals his message, what we learned about him. I thought about this, his earthly life, uh, uh, it also revealed his miracles. His miracles. Well, the, the gospels are packed with miracles. Each gospel gives us a, a different look into the life of Christ. Now, if you did do away, if you did away with one gospel, you're going to knock out a lot of what you learned as a child. I mean, we do understand that all four gospels do not record the exact same things. This is something very important. A lot of people talk about a, a, a story in the Bible and, and they don't know where they got it from. They just remember hearing it. Maybe it was from uh, uh, their childhood. Maybe it was from their teenage years. They, they don't know exactly. They just know it's in the Bible. 
But what we got to understand how important the four Gospels of the earthly life of Christ is because we get the experiences and we get the miracles of, of, of Christ uh, from each writer. Now, when I thought about this, I begin to think about uh, a few examples I want to give you tonight. I'm just trying to help us see the earthly life of Christ. The seven sayings of the cross. You ever thought about that? The seven sayings of the cross. Now, we almost can quote them. But do you realize that it takes all four Gospels for us to know about what happened on that cross and what Jesus said while hanging on that cross? Matthew and Mark give us, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Only Matthew and Mark. Luke gives us, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Only Luke. Luke also is the only writer that tells us, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, speaking to the thief. Luke also is the only one that gives us, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Now when we look in John, we find uh, the other three sayings uh, that's only found in John. Only Matthew and Mark repeat, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Here we see the importance of having Luke and having John and having Matthew and having Mark. John says, woman, behold thy son, behold your mother. John 19, 28 says, I thirst. And John 19, 30 says, it is finished. I, I want, I want to, I want to uh, kind of create an appetite in this class uh, uh, to go back and get in the Gospels and study the Gospels and see how the Gospels um, uh, complement one another in the life of Christ. We're looking at the life, the earthly life of Christ. Let me give you another example. The Garden of Gethsemane, a great experience. I was able uh, in January 2020 to uh, uh, preach in the Garden of Gethsemane. What, a, what an amazing uh, uh, privilege that was. I, I'm humbled at that, that I was able to even go and more or less get to uh, stand and share uh, the Word of God in that garden. But here it is, the Garden of Gethsemane. Only Matthew and Mark call it Gethsemane. Only Matthew tells us that Jesus calls Judas friend. How many times have you heard that preach? Well, it's only in the book of Matthew. Only Luke. Only Luke. And many say that it don't belong in the Bible. And many say that it's not supposed to be in there. Thank God for Luke. Luke said that his sweat was as great drops of blood. You ever heard a, a sermon on that? Well, they're only getting it out of Luke. Only John tells us it was a garden. And only John named uh, of the disciple that cut the ear off of the soldier. The disciple was Simon Peter, and the soldier was Malchus. So my point is, I'm just trying to tell you that the Gospels reveal his message, who he was. That's how we learned about it. That's how we learned about his birth, his life, his death, uh, his resurrection. Uh, I mean, this is how we learned about the Lord Jesus Christ, how important the Gospels are to his earthly ministry. Study that. But here we find, uh, not only do we see uh, uh, that the Gospels are, are so important, uh, uh, if it wasn't for each Gospel, we would only have half the story. In John chapter number 2, Jesus' first miracle in Cana was at a wedding. You remember that? Uh, just uh, not too long ago, uh, me and my wife, we uh, actually got married. Again, in Cana. How about that? Check that out. Right there in Cana. The miracle of Jesus, the first miracle. We've been able to go to Cana. I don't normally do that, but I just knew that picture was up above my head. The first miracle, he turned the water into wine. Now, where did we find that? Book of John, chapter number 2. It's the only place you're going to find that. John chapter 4, Jesus' second miracle. He heals the nobleman's son and never did even go to him. Jesus was in Canaan. The son was in Capernaum. Now, Luke chapter 5. Simon drew all of the fish from the Sea of Galilee after he had cleaned his nets from catching nothing. Luke 7, raising the widow's son in name. He touched uh, uh, the coffin, the, the beer there. He touched uh, her coffin. Matthew chapter 9, he heals two blind men. Matthew chapter 9, he heals a dumb man who couldn't speak. John chapter 5, pool of Bethesda. A man with infirmity of 38 years. 
Bethesda. And, and then in Mark chapter 7, man that was dumb and had a speech impediment, uh, uh, Jesus spit, uh, touched his ears and tongue, and he was healed. Uh, Jesus used spit three times in his ministry. Mark chapter 8, he healed a blind man at Bethsaida. And then he spit on his eyes. Jesus uh, used spit again there. John chapter 9, he healed a man, blind man from birth. Job, Matthew chapter 17 at Capernaum, Simon cast uh, and the fish uh, had a piece of money in its mouth to pay tribute uh, uh, for Jesus and for him. I mean, I could go on and go on and go on, but the reality is uh, we need the gospel uh, writings uh, to understand the life of Christ. Now, when we think about this, uh, the power of his miracles are always amazing to read about, aren't they? And we read them in the Gospels. This is what he did in his earthly life. This is what he did. He was born, you remember, he was a child. We get one understanding of him as a boy. He's there in the temple uh, about the father's business. And then he comes on the scene uh, uh, at, at 30 years old. Uh, and he's now in a public ministry. And, and, and this is what the writing is about. This is what his earthly life uh, is being taught about. And the power of his miracles, he had power to heal. Blindness, sickness, lameness. He had power over demons, uh, casting out demonic spirits. He had power over nature. Uh, the marriage at Cana, walking on the water, calming the storms, the transfiguration, the drawing of fish, the coin in the fish's mouth, the curse of the fig tree. He had power over nature. He had power over death. Raising the young man from Nain, raising Jairus' daughter, raising Lazarus, and then rising himself from the dead. He had power over death. And so when we think about his life, it speaks of uh, the message about him, and it speaks of the miracles performed by him. Uh, uh, but let me end uh, this study and uh, get to where we want to get. His earthly life speaks of the mystery about him. The mystery. Now, we read that in Ephesians, right? When he said uh, to make known the mystery of the God. Isn't that a mystery? Didn't we say last week that that's, it baffles our minds when we try to think that a virgin could conceive? Well, what about this virgin who conceived this son that she bore? What about him living on this earth uh, sinless? Sinless. Now, when you think about this, uh, uh, his life uh, speaks of uh, sinless perfection. You hear that all the time. Uh, people talking about sinless perfection and sinless perfection. Well, I got news for you. Jesus is the representation. Uh, he is the representative. Uh, he is the one who lived. Uh, he is the only one who has ever lived sinless. He's the only one without sin. Uh, he was born of woman. Uh, uh, God gave him a body. And that body that he lived in upon this earth, there was no sin in him. Now, I want to say this to you because this is very critical for what we believe uh, about the doctrine of soteriology. Jesus uh, uh, died for the sin of humanity. We believe that he was the substitution uh, and we understand that Jesus uh, came. Our redemption rests upon Christ's sinless life. And without his sinless life, there would be no substitutionary death. Jesus cannot die in my place um, if he is like me. He cannot die in my place if he has sin in him as me. Jesus did not die because of sin uh, that he had or that he committed. Uh, sin was placed upon Jesus uh, and he bore it at Calvary's cross. Jesus took our sin upon himself. He was not a sinner. And, and this is, you say, well, it, 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 a lot of people uh, uh, don't believe how many people in this world believe that Jesus was just an or, another ordinary man. Maybe he's better than some. Maybe he lived a pretty good life, uh, but he's not, maybe he's a prophet, but he's no different than anybody else. Uh, I mean, Jesus, uh, he died just like everybody else died. No. Jesus uh, died uh, not because of sin, but Jesus died for sin. 
And that is a major difference. Uh, and we must preach it. We must teach it. Uh, and you say, well, Brother Kerry, how can I explain that uh, to uh, you preach the mystery of the gospel? You preach the gospel. Uh, you don't have to explain it. Uh, you just express it uh, in the sense uh, that you don't have to know everything because you want in this finite mind. Uh, but just because you can't comprehend it all, uh, that's where faith steps in. And that's why we must preach the gospel uh, to a lost and dying world that Jesus, took their place. He lived a sinless life uh, and that is why he could die on an old rugged cross. Well, praise God. I'm glad that I preach a gospel that includes the sinless earthly life of Christ. Isaiah 53, 9 said, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Aren't you thankful for that? Luke 1 and 34. We're going to read a few verses right here. Luke 1 and 34 and 35. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now, he was conceived under the power of the Holy Ghost. He was placed in a body that was prepared by his father. There is no, listen to me now, don't bat an eye when you teach it, when you preach it, when you believe it. There was no possibility for Jesus to sin. It's not that he just made it through and by the sweat of his brow he didn't, no, not at all. Our Lord and Savior didn't sin because he couldn't sin. He couldn't sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I've already taught this. I know you've heard it, uh, but there's nothing wrong with repetition. Here is Christ. Here is his body that was given him in this earthly life. And here's the reality. That body was given him. Uh, uh, he, he was conceived uh, by the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, there was a body given to him uh, by God the Father, prepared for him. Uh, it was the blood of God, Acts teaches, uh, that he uh, saves us, that he died for us, that he purchased us with his own blood. And so there is Christ. He is a, a con He's conceived in the womb of a woman uh, uh, named Mary by the Holy Ghost. He's put in a body made by God. The very blood of God uh, is in the veins of Christ. Uh, there is no God in him. There is no sin in him. And what happened at Calvary, and we'll jump ahead just a little bit, uh, was that God uh, imputed our sin upon him, uh, and then God uh, imputed his righteousness upon us. Here's what he said right here. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He was made sin. He knew no sin. I was made righteousness. I knew no righteousness. What a trade. Amen. I mean, we could stop right there. The earthly life of Christ uh, uh, was a perfect life, a sinless life. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18 says, Servants, be subject to your master with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the forward. forward. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongly. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and you suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Verse 22, 1 Peter chapter number 2. Who did no sin? That knocks that out. Well, people talk about uh, Jesus. No, no, he did no sin. He did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. 
who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Do you, do you understand that this earthly life of Christ did not discredit him from being an eternal sacrifice? There was nothing about this earthly life that discredited Christ from being the eternal sacrifice. He knew no sin. He did no sin who his own self bear our sin in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed, for ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the bishop, or the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And so what do we get from that? We're reading scripture to end this up. I want to remind you that we don't take this uh, from uh, our own ideas. This is Bible that Jesus Christ uh, was the perfect son of man, son of God. 100% man, 100% God, uh, yet without sin. Yet without sin. There is no sin. You say, Brother Kerry, you're adamant about it. Well, I'm tired of people uh, preaching a Christ that could have done something uh, that he could not have done. Uh, that, that he might have uh, done this. And I'm tired of reading articles uh, where the blasphemers talk about uh, how our Lord and Savior committed this sin. And he thought this thought. And he did this. No, he did not. Our Bible teaches us uh, that Jesus uh, is the Son of God uh, who knew no sin and did no sin. Uh, and if you want an eternal salvation and if I want an eternal salvation, we must have a sinless Savior. Upon that cross. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Listen now. But was in all points tempted like as we are. Yet without sin. Amen. Yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26 says, For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. I mean, do you understand that the Bible is filled up with uh, text proof uh, that Jesus was sinless. Talking about the earthly sinless life now. First John 3. Verse number 4. Whosoever committed sin transgress, transgress, transgresseth also the law. For, the, for sin is a transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. Here it is. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth have not seen him, neither known him. I mean, I could go on reading. We understand uh, uh, that 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 25. Read that uh, uh, when you can. He, he talks about uh, uh, how that Jesus Christ uh, uh, saved us. Uh, we were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from our vain conversations, uh, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, he goes, hey, he goes on right here to say that we've been born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Isn't it amazing? Uh, isn't it amazing that people want to talk about eternal life, but they, they don't believe they got an eternal word? Could I stop right there a minute and talk about that for a second? I mean, how in the world are you going to stand up and preach about an eternal life and you believe your Bible's got errors? I mean, what do we look like? I mean, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. If you've been telling me about eternal things, you better give it to me out of something that's eternal. Amen. I mean, we live in a time where people are standing up, always correcting their Bible. They're all the time talking about, well, the Bible didn't mean to say this, and the Bible meant to say this, and this verse right here don't need to be in here, and this, and boy, they go through that, uh, and all of a sudden they got so intellectual, they're stupid. 
What, what you you going to tell me? You going to stand and preach to my grandchildren that if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that they can have eternal life, but you're going to then turn around and tell them that you believe this book is full of errors. Uh, uh, you you don't preach to my don't don't preach to my grandchildren. Amen. I mean, we got an eternal book. And here's what this eternal book did. It birthed us from above. He said, uh, being born again, not of incorruptible seed, but of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. How is that possible that God can live and abide forever? There's no sin in God. There's no sin in God. Can I just remind us tonight that there is no sin in God. There is no sin found in Him. There is no sin in Christ. Um, you say, Brother Kerry, I, I believe that. Well, we ought to believe it. And we ought to get back to teaching it and preaching it and saying at the top of our voices uh, that we serve a God uh, who is eternal and his eternality is because that he is not a man in the flesh. He is God in the flesh. Make all the difference in the world. I was shaping in iniquity. I came forth out of my mother's womb speaking lies. I am the one that thirsts uh, for violence and wickedness and, 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 and unholiness. But not, not the Son of God. He came uh, unto this world uh, and he lived uh, on this earth uh, as the only sinless Son of God. When we preach the gospel, you want to talk about salvation, you want to tell somebody they got eternal life, tell them why. They got eternal life because the one that purchased it for them is eternal. He'll never die. There's no way he can die. The wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ uh, did not commit sin. Uh, thank God he was a lamb uh, that took our sin uh, so that we could take his righteousness. Now the gospel. When I began to think about uh, this, I read, in a life that spanned three decades, our Lord never entertained a thought, never uttered a word, never carried out an action that was defiled by an impure motive. He always honored his Father in heaven, always honored his earthly father and mother, never lusted, never uttered a word in sinful anger, never gossiped or slandered his neighbor, never stole, never lied, never coveted. He submitted to every commandment of the law of his God uh, without wavering. He loved the Lord with all of his heart, soul, and mind and strength, and he loved his neighbor as himself. The scriptures bear manifold witness to this truth. And it's one of the most profitable truths upon which we ought to meditate. Jesus is the sinless Son of God.